So in May of 2016, there was a rally that broke out on a, a street corner in Houston, Texas. And uh, the rally was organized by a Facebook group called The Heart of Texas. And the rally was called Stop the Islamification of Texas. Only like a dozen or so people showed up to it. Uh, but at the same time, on the same day, there was a second rally that broke out right across the street from it. So right across the street, another rally. This was organized by the Facebook group called the United Muslims of America. And this rally was called the uh, Save Islamic History. All right. And so two rallies. That one actually had like 135, 140 people come on out to that rally. So two rallies going on at the same time, same day. And interestingly, conspicuously, none of the organizers of those those rallies showed up to the rally. In fact, nobody responsible for those Facebook groups at all showed up to either of those rallies. Anybody know why? Because both groups, both Facebook groups, both rallies were organized by a troll farm in St. Petersburg, Russia. <laughs> Wow, right? So here you have these like Russian hackers that are just making Facebook groups and stirring up conflict and they are just playing us like a fiddle. <laughs> and we're, we're marching to the beat of that drum because, well, oh man, why? How? How are they able to do that? How are they able from thousands of miles away to organize two rallies on the same day in Houston, people yelling at each other? How? And the answer is obvious, fear. Fear, they, they're playing to our fears. They're not, they're not actually causing the fear, right? No, they're not causing the fear. Like, we're already afraid of these things, and they're saying, well, these are the things people are afraid of. Let me tap into those fears, and I can use those fears to manipulate them, right? Because fear is a powerful motivator. And sometimes it's a good thing that it's a powerful motivator. Like, if you're in the woods and you see a bear, fear, great motivator in that moment. But other times, other times, fear, it, it hurts us. It can, can lead us to harmful reactions in our lives. And I, I imagine if I, I gave you uh, a few moments, a few moments in, in your own life to think of the ways that maybe fear, fear has caused you to react, you could think of some examples of things that you did, ways that you responded. They're like, oh man, I wish I didn't do that. But you did because fear got the best of you in those moments where, where you responded in anger and in outrage and you lashed out at maybe one of your kids because, I don't know, you were afraid. You were afraid that maybe they were going to harm themselves or you were, you were afraid that their behavior was going to reflect poorly on you. And so you lashed out. Or, or maybe you, you start manipulating your spouse Right? And you're kind of working behind the scenes and you're manipulating things because you're afraid. You're afraid that things aren't going to work out just the way you want. And so you kind of do all this conniving, this manipulating. Maybe there's a, a dream that you had, a, a goal, a vision, a dream that you had that you just gave up on before you even started because you were afraid. You were fear got in there and you were afraid of what failure might look like. Maybe there's a friend or a family member, a neighbor, somebody who you feel compelled to share your faith with, but you don't because you're afraid. You're afraid what they might think of you, or you're afraid that you might botch the whole thing up, and you're afraid, and so it kind of keeps you from acting there. Maybe you have a boss who comes to you and asks you to do something that you, it compromises your integrity, and you don't want to do it, but you do it anyway. Because you're afraid. You're afraid of losing your job. You're afraid of compromising your, your security in that way. You know, it's tax season. You guys done with your taxes, tax returns? There's not a lot of hands. Guys, it's only like two weeks away. You should get on that. Uh, <laughs> but you're filling out your taxes. You fudge some of the numbers a little bit here and there because you just want to, you know, make sure you have to give the least or you get the most or whatever because you're afraid that, well, if you have to do life with a little less, that you're, you're not sure how it's going to work out. Fear. Maybe you, you enter into a relationship that you, you know isn't right. It's not good for you. It's not God-honoring. But, but you do it anyway because you're afraid of being alone. Fear gets the best of us, and it causes us to, to have these harmful reactions or sometimes harmful inaction. 
I think we've all been there. Today's Palm Sunday, right? Today we celebrate this rally, all right? This rally, crowds of people rallying around King Jesus, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. And what does Hosanna mean? We just learned this. What does Hosanna mean? Save us, right? Crying out, King Jesus, save us. And it's amazing. We celebrate this day, but we also know that there's going to be a second rally just in a few days. And presumably, some of the same people that were at the first rally are going to show up at the second rally, and they're going to rally around King Jesus again, but they're not going to say, save us. They're going to say, crucify him. Two rallies. Crowds of people coming against. What, what's motivating? Fear. Right? People crowding around King Jesus. Jesus, save us! Save us! Who did they want to be saved from? They wanted to be saved from Rome. They were afraid that the Roman Empire was going to continue to pose this threat. They were afraid of Rome, and they wanted King Jesus to save them. Then there's this other rally, and they're crying out, crucify, and why? Well, it's fear again, and we, we learned that the chief priests and the, the scribes, the people that were kind of organizing this whole thing, they were afraid that Jesus was going to cause an uprising in Jerusalem, and if he did, that the Roman Empire would come in and oppress them even more. And so the second rally was also caused by fear of the same thing. <laughs> Two rallies, both of them organized by fear of Rome, of the Roman Empire. Fear, it, it can motivate us to do things we don't want to do, and it can motivate us to not do the things that we do want to do. As, as one scholar put it, fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. All right, that was Yoda. Uh, and it was from the worst of the Star Wars movies, but, but it kind of holds up. Uh, fear is the path to the dark side. And we're coming today to the end of our Wait For It series. We're at the end of Romans 8, where we've been looking at the promises of God, and they're incredible. It's been so rich. And so for much of this, Paul has been speaking to an audience of people that was in the midst of pain. They were, they were in the presence of troubles, right? In the midst of it, right? And there's a group of you in this room that right now, you're in the presence of troubles. Life is hard right now. But as he gets to the end of the chapter, he changes his tone a little bit, and he's speaking less about the presence of troubles and more about the, the possibility of troubles. Because some of us are, are in the presence of troubles. All of us have to wrestle with the possibility of troubles. And these are, these are two different things. Because when you're in the presence of troubles, what's the, what's the big, big issue here, the big danger, is that you're going to give in to despair. And so what does Paul do? He offers hope. But when it's the possibility of troubles, the danger here is fear. And Paul offers encouragement to his audience, the, this church in Rome that he's writing to. They, they have fear of troubles that are coming their way, real troubles looming over their heads. And Paul offers them this encouragement, and, and what he offers and how he offers it, I think we can, we can tap into that and apply that to ourselves today to, to conquer the fears that might be holding us back or the fears that might draw us into harmful, dangerous reactions. And the first thing that he does is he recalibrates their fearometer. That's a real word. Look it up. No, uh, but he recalibrates their fearometer. Look what he does. He starts here. He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? All right? So these things trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword these weren't hypothetical. These were real troubles looming over the heads of the Paul's audience, the people that he's speaking to in the church in Rome, and when it talks about the sword here, this is a euphemism for death. So like all of these hardships and death itself is, is presenting as a potential, like this is a, a possible, a potential trouble that's looming over their heads and it's causing them fear. And Paul speaks into this and he recalibrates their, their fearometer a little bit. And at first when I read this, it it seems like Paul missed the mark a little bit. You know, usually, Paul, you're so intuitive. You get us. You're so, like, emotionally intelligent. But this one seems like you're not quite getting it. And here's what I mean. All right, imagine you have all of your money in, tied up in a bank account, right? All of your, like, your whole 401, everything is just in, in a single bank. And, uh, and I know this is kind of, like, hypothetical. This doesn't really happen. But imagine, like, overnight, you wake up, and overnight, your bank collapsed, I know banks don't collapse overnight, do they? Uh, but imagine all of your money is gone, and you don't know if it's insured, and you're penniless, and you don't know what's going to happen. What's the first question that you're going to be asking? Like, what, what are the pressing questions coming into your mind? Right? Like, am I going to make it? 
what do I do? Am I going to be able to recover? What are people going to think of me? Like, what are the questions that would come into your mind if you were in that situation? Because I imagine for, for most, probably all of us, for all of us, the first question coming into our mind wouldn't be, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Paul, nobody's asking this question. We're, we're trying to figure out if we can feed our families. We're trying to figure out if we're going to crumble under the pressure of this. We're asking if we're going to survive. We're not asking who shall separate us from the love of Christ. And Paul's saying, I know you're not asking that question, but this is the question you want to ask. Because this, this is what should scare the living daylights out of us. Being separated from the love of Christ. He's He's hearkening back to what Jesus said in Luke 12. He says, I tell you, my friends, don't be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more, right? Don't be afraid of those that can bring trouble and hardship and persecution and famine and nakedness and danger and sword, but do no more. I'll show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after the body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Now, we don't like to talk about hell. Uh, For obvious reasons, it's hell, like if, if you do like to talk about hell, by the way, you should get that looked at. We don't, if you don't want to talk about hell, but at the same time, Jesus did talk about hell, so we, we should. And what is hell? The, the Bible gives us different pictures. It's like being cast into fire that never ends. It's like being cast into darkness. But as you, you kind of put all the pictures together, hell is eternal separation from God. That is hell, eternal separation from God. This is what Paul's talking about. Who can separate us? From the love of Christ. This is hell. And he's saying, this, this is what should cause us to freak out, right? You, we have a fearometer. And on that, that spectrum of like how much something, how much fear something should cause. And like over here, you have like, you don't have to worry about it. And like way over here, you have, I'm freaking out. And like somewhere over here, you have, I just wet myself, right? Uh, so you, things are on this, this spectrum. And Paul's audience has over here in the, the freaking out end of the spectrum, trouble and hardship and persecution and famine and nakedness and danger and sword. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. This is the, the thing that should freak us out is the idea of possibly being separated from the love of Christ. That's what should scare the living daylights out of us. And what that does is it, when, when that is here, when being separated from Christ is the real fear, it actually pushes these other fears back into the realm of concern. It doesn't eliminate them. They're still real concerns. Like, they're, they're real things. So it's not like we don't worry about it at all, but they come back to the realm of reasonable concerns. And after Paul... He recalibrates their fearometer and he pushes these concerns back into where they belong, to the realm of reasonable concerns. What he then does is he reinforces those concerns. Look at what he says next. He says, as it is written, so he's he's quoting the Old Testament, for your sake we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. I want you to notice what Paul doesn't do. They're coming here and they're saying, Paul, we're worried about trouble and hardship and persecution and famine and nakedness, danger, sword. Like, we're worried about these things. And Paul doesn't say, he doesn't say, oh, don't worry about that stuff. It's probably not even going to happen. Like, don't worry about stuff that hasn't even, no, no, it's probably not even going to happen. And, and, and have you had people do this, right? You're, you're worried about something and they come, oh, no, don't worry about it. That won't even happen. And maybe they baptize it and they say, God would never let something like that happen to you. That's not what Paul does. Paul actually doubles down on these possible troubles. And he says, oh, no, no, it's it's most definitely going to happen. And this is a a quote from Psalm 44. And it's an interesting psalm because the psalmist, he's crying out to God. He's like, God, we're we're just dealing with trouble and hardship and persecution. Like, it it is coming down on us. We need your help. Give us some mercy here. And there are times in Israel's history, you might be familiar with this. There's a lot of times in Israel's history where they started to rebel against God. And God would bring calamity upon them so that they would repent and turn back to him. This was not one of those times. So in Psalm 44, this is a season when Israel was right, when they were faithful, when they were doing things right. And it wasn't in spite of them doing things right. It was because they were doing things right. It was because they, they were in the love of Christ. It was for his sake that they were facing death all day long, considered to be sh- as sheep to be slaughtered. 
Paul is saying, yet being in the love of Christ does not shield you from troubles or hardships or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. In fact, it turns up the fire sometimes. Like, yes, he, he actually reinforces the reality of these concerns. And he does so, so like casually and kind of cavalierly. And, and the reason he's able to do it so casually is because of what he says next. He says, who's going to separate us? So any, is any of this going to separate us? Simple answer is no. No, the one thing that's supposed to freak us out is like being separated from God. He's saying, no, 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 you don't have to, you don't have to fear that at all. No, why? Because in all these things, we are survivors. Is that what he says? No, he says, in all these things, we are conquerors. It's getting closer, not quite there. He says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. In all of these things, trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, all of these things, we are more than conquerors. This isn't the picture of like the best team in the league going against the worst team in the league, right? Because that's not good enough. Being the best team in the league against the worst team in the league, like sometimes Fairly Dickinson beats Purdue, right? That's not enough. Paul actually says, no, 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 we are more than conquerors. It's more like, it's more like the 1992 dream team against the worst team in your local CYO basketball league. Like, that's the comparison. Mo- not just conquerors, more than conquerors. And he says that we are more than conquerors in every conceivable arena. Look at what he says. I am convinced, he says, Neither death nor life. So some of us, we're freaking out over here. We're freaking out about death. And maybe we're freaking out about our own death. Probably more likely we're freaking out about like other people around us dying, people that we love. Like, oh no, I I don't know if I'm gonna survive if they die. Others of us, we're not not so concerned about death. We're concerned about life, right? Like life is the thing that's gonna kill us. We're concerned about the troubles of life. And some of us, we'd rather rather die than have to suffer in this life on unendingly, and so we're worried about life. We're freaking out about life, and he's saying in life and death, death or life, in both of those arenas, you are more than conquerors. He goes on, and he says, neither angels nor demons. Now, we don't really have to worry about angels trying to separate us from the love of Christ, but you get the picture. He's saying, you go into the spiritual realm, all right? Enter into the spiritual realm, and you go from one extreme, the angels, all the way to the other extreme of the demons, anywhere in that extreme in the spiritual realm, you are more than conquerors. He continues, he says, neither the present nor the future. So the present troubles, neither the present troubles that you're experiencing nor the future possible troubles, neither of these things can separate us from the love of Christ. In both of these arenas, you are more than conquerors. And he says, and nor any powers. All right, I want you to just for a moment, just think, who's the most powerful person in the world? Like, who is that for you? Use whatever criteria you want, like physical strength, political power, social influence, economic power, whatever that is. Most powerful person that you can think of in the world, all right? Imagine that person decides to wage war against you personally. And they, they win battle after battle after battle after battle after battle. But when the war is over, you will not just be victorious, you will be more than victorious. You will more than conquer. Like imagine, so the United States, it's a, an international superpower, right? That's one of these powers, international superpower. Imagine the United States of America turns against you personally, all right? And, you know, for some of you, that, that is your fear. You're like, we're losing our country and they're coming after me. Uh, and so you're like worried about that. Imagine the international superpower coming after you and winning war after battle after battle after battle after battle. Paul is saying, in the end, at the end of the war, you are going to stand victorious because in any arena, you are more than conquerors. And he puts a nice little bow on it. He says, neither heights nor depths. So go as high as you can, go as low as you can, or anything else, nothing else in all creation will be able to separate us. In every venue, you are more than conquerors. Here's what Paul's saying. He's saying, I, repeat after me, repeat after me. I, I believe, I believe that, I believe that we, anybody know where I'm going with this? Raise your hands if you, you know where I'm going with this. Because uh, if you know where I'm going with this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need your help. And I need you to imagine that you're not in church, that you're at a football game. Uh, as we do this. All right, well, let's start again. I'm going to do this again. Now we're at a football game. We're doing this. All right, I, I believe, I believe that we, I believe that we will win. I believe that we will win. 
I believe that we will win. I believe that we will win. And Paul is not chanting this at a football game where maybe you might win, maybe you might lose. No, he's saying, I believe that we will win because we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. An emphasis on on the we here. We are more than conquerors, right? He's not simply saying that God is more than a conqueror and he's going to come in and conquer things for us. He's saying that we are conquerors through him, that God is going to conquer through you. I think sometimes as Christians, we want God to be the conqueror for us. We want God to come in and, and conquer the troubles and the hardships and the, the persecution, the famine, the nakedness, the danger of sword before it ever even gets to us. We, we want to make sure that he's leading us in such a way that we never butt up against the Red Sea, that we never have to face any giants, that we never live in a land where if you simply bow to God, you're going to end up in a lion's den. We want a, a God who's going to lead us in such a way that we're, we're never going to be hanging lifeless on a cross. But God's plan for you isn't to protect you from troubles. His plan is to empower you personally to overcome the troubles. He's not trying to overcome these things for you. He is overcoming them through you. I remember in my old wrestling days, if you're at a tournament, what they would do is they'd call, when it was time for your match, they'd call your name on the loudspeaker and they'd tell you what mat to go to and you'd have to wait till like, the other match was finished. And so you kind of be there and you'd be like warming up and trying to, and then you'd see like your opponent out of the corner of your eye and you're like trying not to stare, but you're like, all right, getting ready. But every so often, like you'd kind of be there waiting for the other match to end and you wouldn't see your opponent. Like, oh, maybe, maybe they won't show. And it would kind of like get excited. Like maybe, maybe they won't show at all. Uh, And it, it would like, not often, but very rarely, very occasionally, it would happen where like the other match would end, it'd be your turn and the other guy was a no show. And can I tell you how relieving that is? <laughs> right? Like, in a split second, the possibility of losing was eliminated immediately. But can I tell you what is way, 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 way more exciting than winning by forfeit? It's when the other guy showed up, and I got to whip his butt. <laughs> and you know what? The... the more intimidating, the harder the opponent, the greater the opponent, the greater their accolades going into that the greater the joy that came with the win. God's plan is not, it's not for you to win by forfeit because he's going to come in and remove these things. He's going to say, no, I'm sending you into trouble and hardship and persecution and famine and nakedness and danger and sword so that you can overcome. You cannot just conquer. You can more than conquer through me, he says. <clears throat> and Paul is convinced. He is convinced of this. Why? Because we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, this is interesting. Paul puts it in the past tense, loved. As in, like, God loved us in the past. But, you know, Paul, doesn't God still love us? You say, like, God loves us currently. But for Paul, as he's talking about God's love, he's not talking about mere sentiment, like, oh, God loves you. No, no, Paul is talking about an event, something that happened in a period in time when God demonstrated his love for us. I think he's, he's piggybacking off of what he said in just a few chapters earlier in Romans 5. He said, you see, just the right time, at just the right time, at this moment in time in the past, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love. He demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, for us, this is a very abstract idea because Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years before we were born. So we're like, yeah, he died while we were sinners. But for Paul, this this is reality. Paul was alive and Paul was sinning the day Jesus died. And Paul can think back to Good Friday, and he might not remember the day, maybe he does, but he can think back at least to that season in life, and he knows who he was, and he knows the sin that he was giving himself over to. He knows that in that moment, he hated Jesus and everything that Jesus stood for, and in that moment, Jesus was dying for him and loving Paul through that. So for Paul, this is so real. God demonstrates his own love for us. That while, while he was sinning, the moment, he was sinning in that moment, and Jesus is hanging on the cross for him. This is the love that he had for Paul. And Paul's saying, this is the love that he has for you. 
This is the love that motivated Paul to become the the most impactful missionary of all time because he knew, he knew how much God loved him because God demonstrated his own love in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He was convinced of this. And he was convinced that absolutely nothing would be able to separate us from that love. When I I think of this idea of of being more than conquerors through Christ who loved us, uh, a story came to mind of a a guy named David Ring. And I I came across David's story several years ago. And and it just kind of stayed with me in the back of my mind. It's uh, so gripping. Because here was a guy who didn't think God loved him. Didn't think God could love him. He didn't even think God liked him. And he had a lot of good reasons for that. And one day, he, he became convinced. He became convinced that God loved him. And it didn't just help him become a, a conqueror. It helped him become more than a conqueror. And I, I want you to be able to hear his story. And uh, I just want to give you a heads up. Uh, you're going to want to read the subtitles. It can be kind of hard to understand him. So you're going to want to follow along with the subtitles. But this is David's story. On the loose, over one dead for 18 minutes. When I was born, I was a stillborn baby. I was a dead baby. I was a blue baby. They put my body on a table in the corner and left me for dead. But it's not over. Until God say it's over. When I was 11 years old, my daddy got sick. Two weeks later, my dad died with cancer of the liver. My mama did everything for me. She fed me, she clothed me, she bathed me, she walked with me. Help me for one day in my life. My mom got sick when I was 14 years old. The doctor came to my family and said, your mama will never come home again. She had cancer. She had six months. I had the very much to live. But I, I got down on my knees. And pray, God, don't take mama. God, don't take mama. God, don't take mama. But in October 1968, my mama took a last breath. And when my mama died, I didn't want to live. I wanted to die, too. I didn't have one thing to live for. Everywhere I want people make fun of me, they look at me and they point and, and call me every name other than my own. He said, look, the boy walk funny, look, the boy talk funny. I went home every day and got in bed and chilled, rolling down my face, begging to die. I attempted suicide every other day for two years. Everybody gave up on me. I gave up on me. One night, I went to church. I didn't want to go to church. I've been to church, but God don't love me. If God love me, why God take away my mama? If God love me, why God pick on me? God don't even like me. But that night I sat down in a church. Then I found out one thing. I found out that God does love me. I found out that I'm not okay, but that's okay. God love me just the way I am. And that night I, I came and I gave my life to the Lord. I went back to school after that night. The student body that called me every name other than my own, a public school. They were so dumbfounded 
they had to hold together a odd good assembly to find out what changed my life. And I said to the body, I, I'm not the same anymore. I've been changed. I gave my life to God. I'm, I don't want to die anymore. I want to live. Why? Because I got something worth living for. God, God called me to go all over the United States telling my story. They tell me I, I will never be, I will never be a preacher. They say you won't ever make it, but I only been doing it 37 years. They said nobody will invite you to their church, uh, but I have spoken in over 6,000 churches. God saw a dead baby, and God brought that dead baby to life. And one day I'm going to wake up, I'm going to have me a brand new body, I'm going to see my mom and my dad again. We're going to live forever, and I'm going to say to my Lord, Lord, why? Have you been so good to me? And I hope it will say, well done, good and favor, servant. Here's a man who suffered all kinds of trouble and hardship and persecution. He was orphaned at 14, bounced around from family to family, didn't even have a home. And he, was, he was dead for the first 18 minutes out of the womb. And now he can't wait to meet Jesus. He can't wait to see Jesus face to face because there's this question, this burning question. He just has to ask Jesus, Jesus, oh, I can't wait to see you because I want to ask you this question, Jesus. Why have you been so good to me? Why have you been so good to me? Because David became convinced that Jesus loved him. And he didn't become a survivor. He didn't become a conqueror. He became more than a conqueror through Jesus who loved him. And before we close, the, the question I, I want you to ask yourself is, what is it that God is empowering you to conquer? What is it that God is empowering you right now in this season of life to conquer? Because Romans 8, Romans 8, it, it, this isn't a defensive language that Paul is using here. And I think it would be a mistake to read it as defensive language, as if all of the trouble and the hardship and the stuff of the world is coming at us and we're going to stand against it. No, no, no. That's not what he says. Just a few verses earlier, he says that nothing is going to be able to stand against us. This isn't defensive language. This is us on the offense, right? This is us pushing back evil and darkness in the world. And he's saying, yeah, we're going to come up against trouble and hardship, and it's not going to stand against us. We are going to be the ones who are conquering it. We're overcoming it in this world. There's a, a commentator that I was reading this week as I was studying. He said it so well that I, I really couldn't say it better than him. So I'm just going to read you what he wrote. He says assurance, and he's talking about this assurance that we are more than conquerors, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. This assurance should never lead us to apathy. Gospel assurance should lead to gospel advancement. Having the promises of Romans 8 should make us bold and courageous. We can plant churches in hard places because Romans 8 is true. We can testify boldly to the claims of Christ in a skeptical world knowing that God is for us. Christ has died for us. The spirit of Christ indwells us. We can go to unreached people groups and herald the gospel through the face of many oppositions knowing that nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
We can stay in New York for the sake of mission when it might be easier to move south because we're more than, okay, that last one's not in there, but, <laughs> but I think it can be added. Uh, but he goes on, he says, we can suffer now because we know glory is coming. So be filled with hope, Christian. Be set ablaze by the gospel. Allow the joy in your heart to spill over into worldwide witness. Romans 8 made Paul the greatest missionary ever, and it can make us more faithful in mission as well if we embrace these truths wholeheartedly and live in light of them passionately. These promises are not simply so that you can stand firm as a world, the world comes against you. No, no, no. He's saying this, these promises empower us to go out into the world so that evil and darkness can't stand against you. And so I, I want to invite you to ask the question. I don't know. I don't know what it looks like in your season in life right now. I don't know what God is, is empowering you to conquer. I don't know what that is, but it could be a whole variety of things. Maybe it's just a particular sin or habit in your life that he's saying, all right, pull this out. This is what you're conquering today. Maybe for you, it's, it's as simple as, you know, there's a, a friend or a coworker, somebody who doesn't know Jesus and God is just calling you to share your faith with them. Or maybe God is calling you to carve out more of your time or your energy or your money to, to give generously to care for the poor and needy. Maybe for some of you, God is calling you to plant churches or be missionaries and bring the gospel to people who've never heard it before, that God is empowering you for these things. Maybe it's as simple as that God is just empowering you right now to bring healing into your broken marriage. I don't know what God is is empowering you for this season, but here's a great place to start. Let's ask him. I want to invite you to ask him, and not just to do this now, but to do this now and tomorrow and over the next several weeks to just simply say, God, what, what is it that you're empowering me for right now in this season? But here's the deal. If you're going to ask the question, then you need to be willing to say yes, whatever he says. Because he might call you into things that you can't conquer on your own, but things that you can conquer through him. And we have an enemy, and that, our enemy is way more cunning than Russia, right? Russia is like getting us to have these petty fights with ourselves, like, oh, we're worried about this and that, so that, you know, we don't notice when they invade Ukraine, right? But our enemy, way more cunning. And he is going to tap into your fears so that when God says, this is what I want you to do, when you get that sense from the Spirit, or you kind of just hear from him saying, this is what I want you to do, he's going to really start pulling on those fears. And he knows what you're afraid of. He knows how to get us to step back from what God is empowering us to do by tapping into those fears. He knows, oh man, he knows that if he can get us more worried about our 401k than the lost souls around us, he doesn't have to worry about it. You guys get this? Satan's worried about you. He's worried about you, the church. He's threatened by you. He knows that you're more than conquerors. He wants to play to those fears. He, he knows that if he can get us more worried about, I, I don't know, our kids being successful and, I don't know, more worried about getting to soccer practice than getting them into the presence of Jesus and having encounters with him and growing up to be faithful followers of Jesus. If we're more concerned, more worried about them being successful than knowing Jesus, well, he's not concerned about a church that's going to die off in our generation. See, he's going he's gonna to play your worries against you so that when, when you ask God, God, what are you empowering me for? He's, you're going to say, ah, it can't be that. That's too much. No, 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 no. Ask God, but be willing to embrace that. And if the, when those fears come, I think we can do exactly what Paul did here. Do exactly what Paul did in Romans 8. And we can start and we can just recalibrate your fear, um, fearometer, all right? And so you feel that fear, you feel tugging, and you're like, wait a second, is this going to separate me from the love of Christ? All right, that's not, that's not something to freak out about. It's something to concern about. Don't need to freak out about it. And then reinforce those concerns. Let them be real. Like, don't, don't pretend that they're not there. That's just going to set us up for disappointment and more struggle. But then remind yourself of your power. Because the same spirit that empowered David Ring to overcome him and be more than a conqueror is the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead and it's the same spirit that's living in you so that we can go out and push back the darkness in this world. And I, I believe that we will win. And the gates of hell will not stand against us. 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this incredible promise that you are not only conquering for us, you're conquering through us, you're empowering us to, to stand up to these pressures that in our own strength would wipe us out, but with you, we are, we are more than conquerors. And God, I just, I pray for us as a, a church, as a community of faith, that the, the women and men in this room right now, God, that, that you would in your grace and your mercy hear their prayers as they ask what it is that you're empowering for them, them for in this season. That as they ask that, that you would answer, that you would, you would let them know through your spirit what it is you're calling them into, God. And that by your spirit, they would, they would have the courage to say yes to things that would crush them in their own strength, but you are preparing to conquer, make them more than conquerors through your power at work within them. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.